Hello everybody, welcome to Last Tenth. You can see that I'm sitting on my rig right now and I'm about to show you how to cut your lap times by making proper use of brake bias. Um, this is particularly important in iRacing's fixed setup series because that's the only change you can make to your car. So without further ado, let's go. So let's quickly talk about what brake bias is. When you press on the brakes, brake bias determines how much of that brake pressure goes to your front brakes and how much of that brake pressure goes to your rear brakes. So in this video, I'm gonna run through a series of braking tests each time changing the brake bias. So you're gonna see how the different brake biases will have different effects on your tires. And through this information, I'm gonna show you how you can use it to get optimal braking or optimal balance. So for this test, it is a straight line braking test, and I'm just going to quickly describe to you what we're seeing on the telemetry right here, okay? Right in front in the center where it says 47.5, what that is is the brake bias setting for the car right now. To the right of that, you see a large green bar, and that is the throttle position, and to the left of that, which will be red when used, is the brake position. On the four corners of this telemetry screen, we see the tire temperatures of each tire. And what it measures is the hottest part of each particular tire. So on the top left, on that box, you'll see the trace for the hottest part of the front left tire. And similarly, on the top right, you'll see the hottest part for the front right tire. Bottom left corresponds to the rear left tire and bottom right corresponds to the um, rear right tire. So you can see here we're going full throttle down the test track and at this point we apply the brakes and immediately you can see how the temperature of the tires have increased. As you can see from the last frame of this test, the tires have heated up because of the braking and you can see that the front tires have increased about 5 degrees in temperature. Meanwhile, uh, the rear tires probably somewhere around 2 to 3 degrees in temperature. So now let's take a look at what happens when we move the brake bias forward. As you can see, we've now set the brake bias at 61.68%, which is higher than before. And what this means is that now more brake pressure is going towards the front brakes and less pressure is going towards the rear brakes. And so the same as before, we're at full acceleration until we hit the braking marker, we apply the brakes, and again, we see the tire temperatures heat up. An interesting observation here is that the front tires heated up more than they did before. This time, you can see the temperature increase is closer to about 8 to 10 degrees. Meanwhile, the rear tires didn't really heat up much at all. In fact, when the brakes were initially applied, the rear tires continued to cool down until a certain point before they started heating up again. Now for our third test, let's see what happens when we move our brake bias all the way rearwards. The setting right now is at 33.3, which is as far back as it can go for this car. As we start the test, we're gonna hit our brake marker and the brakes come on. So immediately you can see a very stark difference. As soon as we hit the brakes, the rear tires just lit up, uh, going from about 43 degrees to maybe about 62 degrees. But meanwhile, the front tires really didn't heat up all that much. We're seeing a temperature increase for about maybe two to three degrees, but compared to the rears, that's really negligible. So what this tells us is that the rear tires being so hot is actually doing a lot of the braking. Meanwhile, the fronts aren't doing much at all, meaning the rear tires are much, much, much closer to the limit than the front tires are. And there's a lot of grip available on the front tires that you could use for braking. I want to show you what happens when you have disproportionate brake bias and you lock one axle. So in this first test, we have brake bias of 61.68%. On the left, you have the same test as before, but on the right side, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lock the front tires and show you what happens. And as we hit the brakes here, immediately you can see the difference in temperatures. On the right side where the tires are locked, the temperatures reach in excess of 100 degrees and these tires are toast, they're overheated and well outside of the operating window. And what's actually happening to the tires here is that iRacing doesn't model this, but in other sims and in real life, we're flat spotting these tires. What that means is that the tires no longer rotating and they're just being scraped and dragged across the ground to the point where the spot that is touching the ground is flat and not round anymore. So basically these tires have been damaged, uh, they've been overheated, and what you really need to do is allow these tires to cool down before the front tires will be able to grip anything. 
For this last test, I'm going to show you what it's like to lock the rear tires. It's the same as before. We have rearward brake bias at 33.3%. On the left, threshold braking. And on the right side, it's the same brake bias, but this time I'm going to lock the tires. We're going down the test straight here, full throttle, and brake marker comes. This is actually pretty interesting. I don't know if you guys noticed it, and you might have to watch it once or twice to see if you picked it up. But what happened was when the brakes initially came on, the rear tires started heating up quite tremendously. But as the rear tires started heating up and losing grip, the car started to spin. When it spun, the car started sliding sideways. And when the tires are sliding sideways, they all began to heat up. What's important here is also we were sliding to the right side. So you actually see the right tires being hotter than the left tires. So what are some of the considerations here? So for maximum braking, you want all four tires to be doing as equal amounts of work as possible. So as a result of that, you should see equal temperature increases across all the different tires. So when you see one set of tires heating up more than the other set, you'll know that there's an imbalance in the amount of work that they're doing during braking. An unbalanced brake bias is not only a straight line braking problem, but it's also a cornering problem as well. And here's why. For example, if you have too much front brake bias and as you're you know, going down the straight and braking and heating up the front tires too much, when you start to turn in, those front tires are going to be too hot to have grip and you're going to start to understeer. And similarly, if your brake bias is too far rearward, the rear tires are going to get too much heat and they're going to lose grip. And as you turn in, the car is going to start to oversteer and maybe even to the point where you'll spin the car. Now, a third consideration is tire wear. Tires that do more work and heat up more are going to wear faster. So if you have an unbalanced brake bias with one set of tires doing much more work or constantly more work than the other set, that set of tires is going to wear faster. And although that might not pose a problem initially, once you're 30 or 40 minutes into a race, the tire wear difference is going to start causing problems to the balance of the car when you're trying to corner it. For those that are wondering, where the heck am I going to get all this data from? Uh, a very easy way is actually just to download VRS. And once the app is running, it will automatically log and upload all this data to the cloud for you whenever you want to review it. So it's actually a very easy and handy way to review a lot of your driving. Let's say you've dialed in your brake bias for straight line braking. And what happens when you start cornering the car? Um, so we're going to run through a couple of tests again. And what we're going to do this time is we're going to corner at the limit at a radius of 80 meters. We're going to hit the brakes with different brake biases. And we're going to see what happens to the car. So the first one we have here is a brake bias of 47.5%. And it's exactly what we did before. So we're cornering here at the limit of the 80 meter circle and we hit the brakes. You can initially see as soon as we do that, the car drifts out a couple of meters as it starts to understeer because, you know, we are working the front brakes a little bit more and the front tires a little bit more, but it's all very much controlled and reasonably balanced. So let's see what happens when we move the brake bias forward. So this time we have 61.68% brake bias, which is what we did before for front brake bias. And we're now cornering at the 80 meter circle and we hit the brakes. And the car immediately darts out of orbit, drifting out. It looked like something like 20 meters. And that makes a lot of sense because now the front tires are trying to do a lot of braking as well as cornering, which it basically can't handle. Now for this last one, we have 33.31% brake bias, which is all the way in the back. And uh, we're going to drive in the circle again. We're going to hit the brakes right around here. And you can see the car just darts in and settles. All the brake is being done by the rear and it's trying to corner as well. So, you know, the rear really loses grip and the front just kind of tucks in. The difference is in effect is actually quite dramatic. And that's partly because the brake bias change is quite dramatic. And um, I want you to see how different it is. So I'm going to put them side by side so you can see them together. So what did we learn here? When you have too much rear brake bias and the rear tires are trying to do a lot of braking as well as cornering and they start to lose grip and the car will begin to oversteer or maybe even spin. 
when you have a lot of front brake bias, the front tires are trying to do a lot of braking as well as the cornering, which usually exceeds the grip limit that you, know, you have on the tires, and hence the car starts to understeer. A brake bias that works in straight line braking might not work for when you're turning or trail braking. So it's important for you to test the brake bias to see what's a good compromise for straight line as well as cornering. So some of you may think that once you've found a sweet spot for your brake bias, you may never have to touch it again. And that's very far from the truth. In reality, you probably are going to have to change it from track to track and maybe even from corner to corner. So here are some examples of what you need to think about that may lead you to change your brake bias. So fuel load is a big and common one. So most cars will have a fuel cell either in the front or the back of the car. So let's take a car with a fuel cell at the back, for example. As the stint progresses and you burn off more fuel, the rear of the car will get lighter and lighter. And as the rear gets lighter, the rear tires have less and less grip. So if you don't change your brake bias through the stint, you will be over braking the rear tires. So what you wanna do is ideally move the brake bias forward as you burn off more and more fuel and the rear gets lighter and lighter. Another one you need to think about is aero. So for example, if you move your aero balance backwards, you know, by say adding more wing, you're gonna increase the grip that the rear tires have. And when the rear tires have more grip, they're able to do more braking, which means you can move your brake bias backwards. But keep in mind that as you slow down in the brake zone, you're going to lose that rear arrow. And as you lose that rear arrow, the rear tires are going to lose more and more grip, which means that the rear brake bias that you had previously set to take advantage of that additional grip may hurt you. And as with all setup, the thing you have to do is find a compromise that works for different scenarios. So one last one I'll talk about is track slope. When you're going uphill, for example, the weight of the car will shift backwards, meaning the rear tires will now have more grip. And to take advantage of that, what you can do is move the brake bias to the back. And similarly, if you're going downhill, the front tires will have more grip and you want to move the brake bias forwards. But the problem is the track's topography changes as you drive around it. So this is probably one of the ones where you need to change it from corner to corner to match the slope. And this is basically what a lot of F1 drivers do. Now, finally, for those who want to know how to change your brake bias in a real life car that doesn't have a brake bias setting, what you need to do is change your hardware. So the easiest is to change your brake pads. What you can do is, for example, put a more aggressive brake pad in the front. So when you brake, you get more braking torque on the front wheels versus the rear wheels, and hence artificially moving your brake bias forward. Another way you can do it is change to larger rotors. With larger rotors, there's more braking torque, and as a result, more braking force at the tire, which is, again, kind of like moving your brake bias around. But the important thing to keep in mind here is that you're mixing and matching equipment that was not designed to be used together. So make sure that you're going to test this carefully, gradually, and safely before you start pushing the car to its limits. That's it, folks. I hope you can use this information to break those personal bests and win those fixed setup races. So in the meantime, keep sending it, and I'll see you next time. Most cars will have a fuel cell either in the front of the car or the rear of the car. So let's take a car with a rear fuel...